Welcome back to Face the Nation. We want to continue our conversation with West Virginia Governor Jim Justice. Uh, Governor, let's pick up where we left off, which was how your state is faring right now uh, with vaccinations and with COVID. Uh, your health officials, Dr. Clay Marsh, uh, at a press conference just this week, talked about how much your medical system is under strain right now, saying the number of COVID cases and hospitalizations is higher than it has been during the entire pandemic. Um, and you yourself said you're right in the eye of the storm. So what's the problem? Why aren't people protecting themselves? Well, Margaret, they are. You know, I mean, we are in the eye of the storm. We're right at the peak of the surge right now. And from our hospital standpoint, we're absolutely, you know, we're, we're still doing elective surgeries and we're still doing all that. We're not overloaded from the standpoint of our hospitals, you know, having to turn people down and all that. We're absolutely, uh, you know, are managing this and managing it in a right way. But we are right at the peak of our surge here, and we're very hopeful that it's starting to decline. It's declining in certain ways, but we're still, we're still going to be very, very vigilant in what we do. You yourself at your press conference this week encouraged parents to vaccinate their children. Um, California's governor's mandating kids 12 to 17 get a vaccine to go into the school room uh, after around January. Are you going to mandate it for school kids as well? No chance. Why? No chance. Why? These, you you uh, mandate as governor, man uh, as governor, you mandate, we looked, measles, mumps, rubella, tetanus, polio, other vaccines. Why won't you put COVID on that list? Now, Margaret, you, you know, you don't have to come in so hot. You guys asked me to come, you know. But, Margaret, the bottom line of the I'm whole thing is just this. I truly... I truly believe that the mandates only divide us and only divide us more. From the standpoint of mandates, I don't believe in imposing upon our freedoms over and over and over. And I've said that over. I don't know how many times I've got to say it. Mm -hmm. But from the standpoint of our children, I'm going, to still, I'm going to still encourage in every way because I truly believe that the more people that we get vaccinated, yeah. the less people will die. But at the same time, we've still got to stand up for who we are. For but crying out loud, we're Americans. I, I know this has become a big um, uh, issue for the Republican Party, which, which you are a part of, in terms of framing this as a freedom of choice. But for small children, you mandate that their parents get them those immunizations so that they are safe in the classroom. They don't have freedoms as children to choose whether or not to get polio or not. We protect them against that. Why don't you want to protect those children by mandating well, it? Mar Margaret, to, uh, to, to think or that I don't want to protect the children is ridiculous. I mean, we all want to protect our children. But parents have decisions to make in this, in this situation, too, just like the local officials have decisions to make. For crying out loud, you know, that's, that's who should be making these decisions is the parents. You know, and, and, and well, from you'd the make those the decisions government, as a governor, actually. Well, we can go on and on about this forever, but, uh, but in this situation, we're not going to change. And, 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 and really and truly, it never has really mattered to me. You know, I, I do think this nation is so divided from the stand, standpoint of partisanship, it's unbelievable. And yeah. right now, what you had AOC say just earlier, you know, our team needs to be better. Well, you elect individuals. You don't elect a team. You elect individuals to come to Washington and mm -hmm. voice their opinions. Yeah. Not elect a party. You know, you elect, you elect, you elect individuals. Right. right. Well, Governor, thank you very much for your time today. All right. <laughs> Only about a third of the world's population is fully vaccinated against COVID, with developing countries lagging far behind. Elizabeth Palmer will have the latest from London. Good morning. We passed another global milestone in the pandemic this week. Five million people have now died from COVID-19. But in Britain, where the London Marathon went ahead this morning, for the first time in two years, fewer people are dying. In fact, thanks to high vaccine uptake across Europe, the death rate here is less than half what it is in America. Not so in Russia, which has had record COVID deaths this weekend. Fewer than one in three Russians have been vaccinated. When a descendant of the Russian royal family was married in St. Petersburg, there were 1,500 guests and not a mask in sight. 
This is typical. Many Russians believe natural antibodies give both adequate protection and bragging rights. Here's Vladimir Putin telling Turkey's President Erdogan his antibody level is 16. Erdogan responds, mine's 100. In Israel, by contrast, vaccines, three of them including the booster, is the new normal for everyone over 12. That's coverage the developing world can only dream of. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala heads the World Trade Organization. While nearly 60% of people in developed countries are fully vaccinated, in Africa the figure is barely 4%. African leaders want countries like the U.S. to lift vaccine export controls to free up millions of doses. But in the wealthy West, the rituals of life as we knew it are returning. In France, La Bise, the kiss on the cheek, is back. That is as long as a vaccine-resistant mutation of the virus doesn't emerge, but epidemiologists are saying that's still a very real possibility. Margaret? Elizabeth Palmer in London, thank you. We go now to former FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who also sits on the board of Pfizer. He is the author of Uncontrolled Spread, Why COVID-19 Crushed Us and How We Can Defeat the Next Pandemic. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb, always good to talk to you. I want to pick up with you where, where I left off with uh, Governor Justice, which was on this question of vaccine mandates for children. Um, he didn't like the comparison of the COVID-19 vaccine to all the other vaccines he mandates as a governor. Measles, mumps, rubella, tetanus, polio. Should it be considered different? Well, I think it's inevitable that the COVID vaccine is going to be incorporated into the childhood immunization schedule. Um, CDC ultimately has to take that up. My guess is they're not going to take that up until you have fully approved vaccines for children, until you have more than one vaccine in the market available to kids. So that might be more of a fall 2021, 2022 um, type of event. But you're going to see other states and local districts moving forward with their own mandates. And I think the right locus for decision making around these mandates is at the local level. So you're going to see other states like California taking this up. Right. Which they did. But Governor Justice, what you're talking about is a practical matter of timing. He said it's about personal freedom and parents making decisions for themselves. And it's a theme that we continue to hear, particularly from Republicans. Um, Senator Ted Cruz this week said he stands with NBA players refusing to be vaccinated, for example. The Republican governor of Texas, Florida, they're saying it also it's a matter of free choice. You've been concerned about politicization of vaccines. Aren't we already there? We are there. Look, these are not just individual choices. These are collective decisions. And we've always looked at vaccination as a collective decision. That's why we have a childhood immunization schedule, because your behavior with respect to your choice around vaccination affects your community. That's why I think the, the right locus of decision making around these mandates is as local a level as possible. So to the extent that governors and mayors can do this, I think that's going to depoliticize these kinds of decisions. It's when the federal government steps in that this becomes more of a political issue. I do worry about the consequences of the moment we're in, the fact that now vaccination is something that's dividing us culturally and politically, because I think that's going to have broader implications than just around COVID. I worry that going forward, we're going to see vaccination rates decline as this becomes more of a political focus. Football, and we see people, literally governors, running against vaccine and vaccine mandates in the next presidential cycle. That's going to be deleterious to the public health generally if that's what comes out of this episode we're in. And that was your, if I understand it, your chief criticism of President Biden's decision a month ago to issue a mandate, one he hasn't filed for yet, but at least announced. Yeah, I would be trying to use um, big carrots rather than sticks when it comes to private businesses. I think that that's where they might have crossed the line that really created more acrimony and gave people on a political right, frankly, something to now run against. Certainly the federal government's well within its right with the mandates on federal workers. I think health care workers should be mandated to get vaccinated. We require them to get vaccinated for chicken pox and hepatitis B and influenza. I think a mandate inside the Medicare program makes a lot of sense, using the Medicare program to try to incentivize Medicare providers to get their populations vaccinated at higher levels. That's going to protect a lot of senior citizens. So there's certainly tools that the federal government has at its disposal. But I think when you get 
getting down to private businesses within states, you want to see those decisions made by the businesses by the, at the local level. And I think the federal government could step in with incentives to try to drive that behavior. Mm -hmm. um, we asked Dr. Fauci about this pill from Merck uh, that was announced as being successful 50 percent of the time in reducing or excuse me, reducing by half the chance of hospitalization. Um, 1.7 million doses. Are you concerned that's not enough? Well, it's not enough. 1.7 million doses, um, by virtue of the indication that this is probably going to be approved for, would cover us with one month of the Delta wave. I mean, it would have covered one month of the Delta wave in the South. So I think that could have been a little more forethought to trying to get more manufacturing in place and procuring more doses. Just to give you a basis of comparison, the Strategic National Stockpile has anywhere between 50 million and 80 million courses of therapy for a feared pandemic flu. So, you know, contracting for 1.7 million doses wasn't enough to cover any appreciable portion of this pandemic. This drug looks very promising. This is the most profound treatment effect based on the top line data that I've seen from an orally available drug in the treatment of any respiratory pathogen. So, you know, hopefully Merck is going to be in a position to file the data with FDA this week. They can make an emergency use authorization request as early as this week. Mm -hmm. And depending on how long the FDA takes, and the FDA has seen a lot of this data already, you could see this drug available very soon. Is it going to have to be ra rationed, rationed, though? Depending on what happens with the uh, COVID spread, it's going to have to be rationed. Yeah, I would expect to see a scheme similar to what we have with the antibody drugs, where this is going to be allocated to states. All right. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb, thank you for your analysis, as always. We're going to talk police reform up next with Senator Cory Booker. Stay with us. Last Sunday, South Carolina Republican Senator Tim Scott gave us his explanation for why bipartisan negotiations on police reform collapsed. We spoke Friday to his Democratic counterpart. Senator Cory Booker told us that despite getting the Fraternal Order of Police, the country's largest police union, to support his bill, he couldn't get Republicans to do so. The last straw, he said, was when Senator Scott refused to codify former President Trump's 2020 executive orders, which required certain criteria for police departments to receive federal money. That prompted Senator Booker to walk away, something for which he says he takes full responsibility. We were willing to take a lot less. I, I told my staff, we're not going to take half a loaf, let's take a couple slices of bread. Uh, the one area we had was on chokeholds, where there was conditions of grants and the like, but there was no other areas of agreement that we had yet established. And when we started giving some just basic lines on things that we didn't think were that great, uh, we couldn't get the agreement there. And it's unfortunate because basically the, the, the issues that the families were asking, these are families of people that were murdered, the issues that the police officers are now standing up and agreeing with us, and, and by far the, the majority of police officers are represented by at least the FOP, what everybody was saying is, let's take a, a, a situation, just increase transparency, raise professional standards, mm -hmm. and create more accountability when an officer does something really, really against uh, the law as well as our common values. That's what we were looking for. So uh, specifically, because Senator Scott was specific in his criticism, he said do you, that you wanted police departments to hand over data to the federal government from every investigative encounter with police, including routine traffic stops. Or if they don't do that, they would risk losing money. I think that we should be in a nation that if an officer uses physical force, whether that's a billy club, that, that data should be collected. Right now, we do not have a collection on these things. I think to give transparency to any town, we should start understanding what are the traffic stops, uh, the demographics of those and the like. We live in a country where both Senator Scott and I have had personal experiences mm -hmm. uh, with wrongfully stopped, being stopped by police, guns drawn on us, accused of things that we didn't do. If there's no transparency into those actions, we can't deal with it as former manager of a city. If you can't measure it, then you can't manage it. So given that you say you did have some areas of agreement. We, we had one area of agreement on chokeholds, mm -hmm. which frankly, all across the states, red states and blue states are banning those actions. Yeah. We did not have enough to do the kind of data transparency that was necessary, the kind of raise in professional standards that even police officers are now saying the majority of uh, uh, folks who represent them. And we did not have real consequences. Remember, there are things we've been debating from the beginning 
about qualified immunity, other shields to holding officers that do bad things accountable. But qualified immunity had been put to the side for the moment. Is that correct? It, there's definitely, this is what I mean about not being willing, not yeah. sticking with the full loaf. But we did want what the FOP and others agreed to is some movement on the criminal standards and some movement on holding municipalities account, accountable for when their officers do horrible, horrible, illegal things. So the argument that, the, that Senator Scott was making is that doing that by saying there will be punitive action against you or you won't be eligible for those grants, it is akin to restricting funding. And he used that term defund the police, um, which has frankly dogged Democrats. Um, for some time uh, because it, it just, it, it creates a perception of being somehow soft on crime, right? So how do you respond to that? Do you think when he is using that particular phrase in explaining why you walked away, uh, that, that this is just a political game? Again, th this is a moral moment. This is not about a back and forth between uh, Tim and I. It's a moral moment. And to get big compromise bills done, which I've accomplished before, you, you have to have people that are willing to take risks. But it was Democrats together. who walked away twice. That's what he would say, and that's what Republicans have said. In 2020, it was Democrats who walked away from a Republican police reform bill, uh, again, and this time, Democrats are walking away. I mean, by that math, they, they, they walked away from the George Floyd bill. Remember, there was two bills put out. We were trying to do the honest, w hard work of finding a compromise. Along that pathway, we did something people didn't expect. Major law enforcement organizations who are not known to agree with Democrats came to agreement mm -hmm. and we didn't or were not able to land it we would not have gotten the people on the fringes people uh, in both parties would have disagreed with it i will not give up on this bill because it is not a partisan issue it is a moral issue so, we have a problem in policing in america so what does that mean because president biden when he blamed republicans said he's going to get this done through executive action what you're saying it sounds like you're going to try to revive this i think this, uh, there's a lot that president biden is going to step up and do and i'm excited about that and for washington the world i'm a baby i've been here for eight years but i do know now on the big bills that i've been able to get passed compromise bills in the criminal justice system it often would take more than one congress we are going to do this because the families deserve it there is not enough justice in when? policing Whenever we when? can. I mean, I, uh, we had a racial justice protest movement that shook this country. Right. This was an opportunity. Yes. We've been through two Congresses now. Are you telling us wait till after 2022? So again, as Martin Luther King would say, how long? <laughs> you know, it, people have been told to wait. Uh, justice delayed is justice denied. And for those families I've talked to over the last weeks, they are rightfully impatient. I cannot change uh, uh, the minds of some Republicans, but I've got enough momentum now that I'm going to continue to work. I can't tell you when, but I will tell you this. We have already seen progress from Kentucky to Colorado. We have seen the activism of people in the streets demanding it create real substantive change. We offered in these negotiations. But if Democrats lose the majority in 2022, do you think you are more likely to get the kind of change you I, want? I, I don't know what it is. I'm telling you I'm not giving up. And again, law enforcement leaders will tell you this, where we have a lot of work to do so that everybody doesn't feel like I felt growing up, and a lot of kids do, is when you see a police officer, your first instinct is fear and, and not like, hey, there's somebody here to help me. And so, so we need to create transparency, accountability, and raise professional standards. The majority of police officers, at least the unions that represent mm -hmm. them, agree with us now. We have more work to do to get this done. Senator Scott says he's at the table. Will you come back to it, or are talks completely dead at the moment? Uh, again, Senator Scott and I actually are friends. And so the, the, I, I'm more than confident, especially as I look at other Republicans there and other folks to deal with, that we're going to find a way to keep working on this issue. We came to a stalemate uh, when we couldn't embody Donald Trump's EO in legislation as is. Th that's problematic for me. But again, this is going to continue to be an urgency in my life. And as a person who has been able to deliver significant reform in the criminal justice space, I'm going to continue to work on this. And America Police officers, as we're now seeing, conservative think tanks, all mm -hmm. are calling for change. We're going to build on that coalition, and we're going to, I believe, we're going to get this done. Senator Booker, thank you for your time. No, thank you very much. You can watch our full interview with Senator Booker on our website. We'll be back in a moment. Americans seem to be increasingly splintered these days, and now that anger and partisanship is impacting our children. Attention, angry American parents, your children, and the rest of the country are watching. 
Scenes like this outside a school board meeting in Tennessee last month, or this one in Idaho, where anti-mask protesters caused local officials to cancel their meeting due to safety concerns, triggered an unusual emergency request for federal assistance to stop violence against public school children, board members, and local educators. In a letter to President Biden, the National School Board Association appealed for help. These threats to school board members is uh, horrible. They're doing their jobs. The board compared the angry eruptions to domestic terrorism and hate crimes. It isn't clear what the feds can actually do about the basic lack of respect and civility plaguing communities right now. Show some respect. The spate of physical attacks on flight attendants enforcing mask rules is just another example of self-righteous adults behaving badly. It seems the anxiety caused by the pandemic has made it even harder for many of our fellow Americans to listen to each other and to forget how to have a civil conversation about difficult issues. At least eight states have enacted legal bans on teachers even discussing theories regarding race-based privilege. Racial equity is one of the most explosive topics at school board gatherings. It is dangerous to our children when the parents themselves are the school bullies. It poses a threat to the very foundational levels of our democracy, basic education. Not every act needs to be political. Putting a mask on your child amidst the pandemic is just practical. Avoiding masks is not in the Bible, but taking care of others is. As this Tennessee dad explained to his kindergartner. She went to school and was one of just a few kids in her class wearing a mask, which made her ask me why she had to. My answer was because we want to take care of other people. She's five years old, but she understood that concept. And it's disappointing that more adults around here can't seem to grasp it. Perhaps the children could teach us a thing or two about civic duty. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.